Observational cosmology is on the verge of entering a new era. Within a few years, the next generation of ground and space-based telescopes like Euclid, Rubin, and the Simons Observatory will be eclipsing the results of the current benchmark experiments. For obscure historical reasons, this is called the era of stage four cosmology. But while we wait for those telescopes to take their data or even be built, one stage four telescope has already won the race. And today we've got the results from their second batch of key papers. About six months ago, DESI, the Dark Energy Spectroscopic Instrument, released the first cosmological results from their year one data. These results just focused on the baryon acoustic oscillations feature in the galaxy correlation function and found some fascinating hints beyond the Lambda CDM cosmological model in the form of evolving dark energy. Today, we have Arno, Clement, Hector, Gilmarin, and Pauline Zaruk from DESI talking about the collaborations analysis of the full shape of the correlation function something that has allowed them to constrain deviations from not just the Lambda CDM model, but also general relativity on cosmological scales. And I'll let them tell you what they found. Hello, wonderful people. Welcome to the era of stage four cosmology and welcome Arno, Hector and Pauline. Do you want to start by telling us briefly about these full shape DESI results? For the first time with DESI, we measured the rate at which structures grow over 11 billion years and uh, it allows us to test uh, the validity of uh, our theory of gravity, which is based uh, on uh, Einstein's general relativity at cosmic scales. And we also put constraints on uh, alternative models of gravity, which uh, could explain the accelerated uh, cosmic expansion. So with only one year of DESI data, we measured uh, this growth rate of structures at the same precision as what was done in previous experiments with 20 years of observations. Cool, that's very exciting. What new insights did you obtain as a result of doing these analyses? So we probe very complementary uh, information to the one uh, from the bio-only uh, analysis. In particular, as I said, we tested uh, the validity of gravity at cosmic scales. And here you can see one uh, of the, the new DESI results where we plot uh, this growth rate of structures, uh, F sigma eight as a function of redshift. And uh, in gray, you had the previous generation SDSS measurements. And in uh, colored, you have uh, R measurements from the different DESI samples. And you can see also the prediction from general relativity in a dashed black. And the colored line are different values for a parameter that probes modification of the gravity. And uh, on this uh, plot, you can see that we have a similar precision on this growth rate uh, of structure at a redshift below 1.5 for our DAISY year one measurement, so one year of observation with SDSS, which was 20 years of observations. So this really shows the, the constraining power of, of DAISY and more data is also coming, so yeah. Should we be reading from this plot that general relativity is in pretty good shape? Indeed, yes. With our measurements, uh, we uh, validate general relativity at a cosmic scale, so we don't see any deviation from our theory of gravity. And in the next slide, we also uh, show constraints on the modifications uh, of uh, modifying gravity. So here in the parameterization, uh, mu zero, sigma zero, both are uh, here constants that uh, modify the, uh, the perturbations and the uh, gravitational uh, interaction. And here you have the results from um, DESI only, which is in blue, well, DESI plus uh, PBN uh, prior. You have the results from the CMB in orange, the combination of DESI with CMB in green, and the combination of DESI, CMB, and DES year three, the three times two point uh, analysis where there is a, a black cross. So this is where uh, general relativity uh, is. Uh, our measurements are consistent with other measurements and they are all consistent with uh, general relativity. Was there anything while you were doing the analysis that came up that was particularly surprising, either in the cosmology or in the actual analysis pipeline? Yeah, so from a methodology point of view, and this is something we'll, uh, we'll go back to it, uh, 
we had to deal uh, with projection effects uh, that happen in a high dimensional parameter space because as we were saying we have improved uh, the way we uh, we model our observable the power spectrum and to do that uh, we have included more parameters that are uh, theoretically motivated but they come at the price of uh, being degenerate with cosmological parameters and then when we analyze our data we assume priors for the non-cosmological parameters because the choice of priors is important when interpreting our, our results and uh, it required an additional effort with respect to the BO on the analysis. This is also the reason why we didn't uh, publish this analysis at the same time. When you say projection effects, you're meaning in like a statistical sense when you have say 20 parameters and you're only interested in say five of them and you're trying to like marginalize over the other 15 that you kind of projection. You're not talking about some observable thing where things are being projected on the sky. Exactly, yeah, that's the statistic. Cool, before we get into the actual methodology and, and details, if there were only two things people remember about this paper or this video in six months, what would you want them to be? I think it's important that uh, people uh, remember that with this uh, full shape measurements, we are able to probe the structure formation, while uh, with BAO analysis, we just probe the background evolution. And with these measurements, then we can test the validity of the theory of gravity at cosmological scales and uh, constrain modify gravity models. And that the answer is that so far everything is consistent with GR. Shall we get into some of the background now about exactly how you are measuring gravity? What does the full shape mean when you say full shape and things like that? Sure. So what we mean by galaxy full shape is uh, that from our measurements, our large scale structure catalog, we are going to, to compute uh, to point statistics here, the power spectrum, the monopole in blue and the quadrupole in, in orange. And the fact that we measure observed redshift, we know that uh, the observed redshift has uh, two components, the Hubble flow and a second component, which comes from the line of sight galaxy peculiar velocities, which causes the redshift space distortion defects and which uh, which leads to a non-zero uh, quadrupole. And the amplitude of our uh, quadrupole is uh, proportional to this growth rate of structure parameter that uh, we, we want to measure. So by modeling the full shape of the galaxy power spectrum, and not only the position of the BO peak or the wiggles in the power spectrum, as for a BO only analysis, we are able to uh, probe the growth of structures to test the theory of gravity and dark energy and uh, constrain also, we'll see later, the sum of the neutrino masses. So in this video, we can see uh, how uh, structure uh, formation uh, is uh, related with the underlying uh, theory of gravity. So by, by changing our, our, our theory of gravity, uh, it impacts uh, the uh, amount of structures uh, that are formed and the way they are, they, are, they are structured. And this is exactly what we are aiming at, uh, at probing with the galaxy full shape uh, analysis. So it's essentially how strong clustering is across, I mean, across, along the line of sight compared to across the line of sight when you don't suffer right space distortion. So the more gravity or the more intense gravity is, then the more intense the clustering is along the line of sight, but not across the line of sight, which remains uh, constant because essentially what you are measuring is like the peculiar velocities of galaxies on the axis of your line of sight. You don't detect velocities across the, your line of sight, but you only detect them along the line of sight because you measure the rest. So this is the only way you have to measure how much clustering increases along that uh, direction because you are essentially positioning galaxies in places where they shouldn't be because they are moving towards centers of gravity. And then you measure redshift, then you infer distances from this redshift. And then depending on how much the peculiar velocity is, then you get a, an enhanced boost in the signal along the line of sight. Naively, I'd have thought that modifying gravity might also just change the monopole of the power spectrum. But is that like just too degenerate with, say, the, ampli the primordial amplitude of the power spectrum and stuff? So it's in principle happening, but in practice not detectable, whereas the redshift space distortion stuff is, is not degenerate with other, other stuff? The monopole is an angle average. So modified gravity does change the, the monopole. Uh, the issue is that 
these changes that generate with the galaxy bias that is typically a nuisance parameter. So the key thing of using as well the quadrupole is that this enhanced signal changes differently in the quadrupole and in the monopole. So you can essentially break this degeneracy between growth of structure and bias when you are using both. Uh, maybe to put it a little bit differently. So uh, once we marginalize over galaxy bias that we assume are known, um, actually our measurement is sensitive to the amplitude of the velocity diversion of spiral spectrum. That is basically the standard deviation, you know, the RMS of, um, of galaxy velocities. And that is what we actually probe with this full shape analysis. And that is what is uh, sensitive to modified gravity. Cool. Yeah, let's get into the details then of precisely what, what you've done, how you've updated the analysis to extract the full shape and what uh, this, these projection effects were and why they're important. So this slide shows the institution that participated DAISY to actually present DAISY in the shortest time possible. I think it's worth just looking at this uh, very nice video that presents the DAISY instrument. Light first reflects off of the telescope's 15-ton primary mirror, then onto its six large lenses that ensure DAISY maintains a wide, highly focused view of the sky, covering an area about 38 times larger than the full moon. These lenses are housed in a device that can be adjusted within millionths of a meter to preserve the alignment of those lenses. After passing through the set of lenses, the galaxy's light reaches fiber optic cables in DESI's focal plane at the top end of the telescope. 5,000 robotic positioners, each carrying a single optical fiber, are programmed to move to pre-selected sequences of galaxy targets. This automated dance of robots allows DESI to target sequences of thousands of galaxies at a time. The optical fibers, which serve as DESI's eyes, send the galaxy's light down the length of the telescope to 10 spectrographs. So you see that the light is reflected by the primary mirror, then um, onto the corrector, and then to, which focalizes the light onto the focal plane, which is equipped with these 5,000 uh, spectro spectroscopic fibers that actually guides the light from the image of the galaxy in the focal plane down to 10 spectrographs. And this, this focal plane, equipped with 5,000 fibers, is something that we'll um, discuss a bit later um, in this presentation, because we actually have many fibers, 5,000 uh, 5, fibers, which is uh, five times more than uh, what we uh, used to have in SDSS, EBOS. But uh, that also means that we will not measure spectra for every object, every galaxy. And so this will create systematics in our measurement, and this is something that uh, we'll need to be corrected for, and this is something that we'll discuss a bit later. So DAISY, DAISY is, uh, well, stands for Dark Energy Spectroscopic Instrument, um, and its goal is to measure uh, millions of redshifts. And uh, what we see on this plot is the number of redshifts as a function of the year, and we see that DAISY really lies into, on this uh, exponential relation between the number of redshifts that we measure and the year. Uh, so that basically means that every 10 years we multiply our sample uh, the size of our spectroscopic sample by a factor of 10 which is awesome right so we see that daisy is just between sdss so that was the previous largest spectroscopic uh, data sample and daisy 2 and stage 5 experiments so just being mildly cynical i guess when you guys show your daisy year one plots compared to sdss the error bars are all kind of similar whereas on this plot it looks like you should have had 10 times as many galaxies. What, what, what's going on there? You, you are completely right. Uh, we have about a factor of three more redshift with the year one, uh, DESI year one observation than the total uh, SDSS uh, uh, sample. So indeed, we do have more redshifts and we see the improvement uh, in the BAO uh, measurements for the full shape analysis, uh, given that we have tried to improve our methodology and we are using uh, a more complete theoretical model, which is more theoretically motivated, but as I we said, which, which comes also with uh, more parameters. So there is uh, also a compromise uh, there. This uh, figure shows uh, the various uh, DAISY samples. So we start at low redshift with uh, the Bright Galaxy survey, uh, which uh, by the end of DAISY will uh, contain 14 million uh, galaxies. So that's a sample at a redshift between 0 and, and 0.4. And in parentheses, I put the numbers for SDSS. So in DAISY, we actually have already, in DAISY-01 data, we actually have uh, many, many bright galaxies more than SDSS. 
Um, so LRG stands for Luminous Red Galaxies. We've got 8 million, of, uh, we'll, by the end of DESI, we'll get uh, 8 million galaxies uh, between 0.4 and 0.8. At higher redshift between uh, 0.6 and 1.6, uh, we have uh, 16 million EAGs uh, by the end of DESI. Uh, so here, really, we increased the larger statistics compared to, uh, to SDSS, where we only had a small samples of EAGs. Uh, that was actually very useful um, to prepare the DESI, uh, DESI survey. And at higher redshift, we need to target very bright sources. So we target quasars, 3 million of them. So at a redshift between 0.8 and 2.1, we use quasars as direct tracers of the matter fields. So just as galaxies, right? And uh, at redshift above 1.8, uh, we are using quasars in a different way. We're actually using the full quasar spectra. So we're looking at the absorption features in quasar spectra, which comes from the absorption of light by uh, the neutral hydrogen along the line of sight, so between the quasar and, uh, and the telescope. So this analysis is called uh, lyman alpha forest analysis, and uh, it was performed for the uh, BO measurements uh, that we presented back in April of this year. But uh, in, the pre in the results that uh, we presented today, uh, there is no update on this analysis. So we've just used uh, the previous BAO measurements obtained in April. Should these redshift ranges, are they technically approximate? Because I, I presume there are LRGs at redshift 0 0.38 and 0 0.82. Or are these exact in the sense that you kind of define an LRG to be only those things that are like an LRG and are above redshift of 0 0.4? Yes, so when we perform this DAISY survey, I mean, at the very beginning, we start from imaging data where we select um, targets for which we want to measure spectra, right? So this is actually where the LRG sample is defined, just as bright galaxies, EAGs, and quasars. These are defined by selection cuts, so color selection cuts, magnitude cuts in this photometric data. And so this is really where uh, these samples are defined. And then we obtain redshift for these targets. And indeed, so in a redshift catalog, we have LRGs below 0.4 and above 0.8, definitely. And just to complement a bit what Arno said, uh, the science driver of DESI is the BAO measurement. So these, uh, these samples were designed so that they maximize the BAO signal and the constraints on the BAO measurements. Okay, so now I'll focus on this uh, DESI data release one, year one, which we used for the a uh, BO measurement that we presented back in April and, um, and for this full shape measurement that uh, we're presenting today. So observation started in May 2021 and ended in June 20, uh, 2022. So that's for the uh, DR1 sample. And you see uh, here on this plot, well, the footprint corresponding to this uh, year one uh, sample and color coded is a fraction of final coverage. So that means that in, re in red regions, we have actually observed these regions to full coverage, which means that for the dark time, we've performed seven observations at these locations. And in blue, that's regions where we only observed once. And this is typically where we have the most issues with the fiber assignment systematics that we've uh, mentioned earlier, that is, uh, we, we are not able to resolve galaxy pair at small separations. So uh, at some point, there was some discussion whether we would take the full footprint for the analysis or just restrict to, uh, to the most complete footprint uh, in red. Uh, but we've decided for the year one analysis that we would be able to consider the full footprint uh, thanks to our improvement in, um, in the mitigation of, of these uh, fiber assignment effects. So by the end of DAISY, we'll uh, observe these 40,000 square degrees footprint. That will be totally red. Uh, so that's the objective um, for 2026. So at the bottom of this slide, you see a timeline. The year one data sample was secured in 2022, and we are now in 2024. Uh, so again, yes, in, uh, in April 2024, we released the first uh, cosmological measurements using this um, DR1 release, performing BO measurements. And now we are at the end of 2024, the end of the year, and we are re releasing this uh, new analysis full shape analysis, which is a bit more technical than the BAO analysis. So that's why it, it was a bit delayed, but we already have the year three data sample on disk. So we currently in, within DAISY, we are starting to perform the analysis of this uh, year three data, starting again with um, BAO measurements. So definitely stay tuned because uh, we'll have some results uh, relatively soon on, on this. So that's very exciting. A year or 18 months? Next March. <laughs>
Next March. Wow. Okay. I don't know if you're allowed. Is that is that allowed to be said on camera or is that in private? I, I think this is okay to say that we will aim for BAO uh, measurements with DR2 with the second data release by March 2025. And is that um, year three data? What factor number of more galaxies do you have compared to year one? Is it 10 times more or five times more? Or? It's a 6 million uh, sample for your one, and it's uh, 33 million uh, redshifts for your three. Roughly speaking, is a reduction of a factor of two in error bars. Uh, so this is an overview of the DR1 the, the uh, release in terms of number of redshifts. Um, so on the left, we see the number density as a function of redshift for the different samples that uh, We've seen so with the bright galaxy survey in green, uh, the LRG sample in red, uh, emission line galaxies in purple, and the quasar sample in fresh green, and uh, and so that amounts to 5.7 million unique redshifts uh, below 2.1. And so these different samples, we have used them for the BAO analysis that we presented in April, and we have used them as well for the full shape analysis that we are presenting today. On the right, you see the number counts for the Lyman alpha forest. Uh, so this is actually the number of pixels. So that is the basic units in spectral measurements. And it shows that, uh, yes, the distribution of, um, of these um, Lyman alpha pixels, the number density of these equations in range, and uh, compared to that of the SDSS in green. So on the side of the Lyman alpha, they add basically a factor of two improvement compared to the SDSS in terms of abundance of data. And C sample was used for the BAO measurements in April that we will use for our final cosmological constraints today. I've spoken a lot about these April uh, uh, measurements. So here are the, the BAO measurements that we obtained as a function of redshift. So in the upper panel, you see the isotropic BAO measurements. So what is the apparent size of the BAO shell in the distribution of galaxies? So that's what we measure for the BGS and the two LRG redshift beams, a combined LRG plus EHG sample, and then the high redshift EHG sample, quasars, and Lyman alpha forest. So C shows the measurements of the, of the two-point correlation function, the monopole of the two-point correlation function, where we very clearly see the BO peak. And, um, and so just as a reminder, C is, the goal of this BO analysis was to measure the position of this BO peak in the correlation function, which actually probed the apparent size of this BO spherical shell. And uh, by measuring the apparent size of this BO spherical shell at different epochs in the universe, then we are able to, to actually probe how the universe expands with time. In the, in, the, in the bottom panel, you see anisotropic BO measurements. So we here we really see uh, whether this uh, BO signature is spherical within the coordinate that we've chosen, in the fiducial cosmology that we've chosen. So if the fiducial cosmology that we chose was not the correct one, then we would see uh, deviations in, the, in this uh, anisotropic uh, BO scale. So these are our measurements that we obtained in, in April uh, 2024. And what we've done since then is add this full shape information to these measurements. Okay, so now let's move to full shape results. These are the key paper that uh, will be released on this date. So we first have a paper on the actual clustering catalogs, how the different samples are defined. So you had some questions about the, about the rating frames that we use for our analysis, for example, and um, this definitely will be explained in this uh, first paper. That will also present the two-point clustering measurements, that is correlation function and power spectrum, and the estimation of coherence matrices. We also have a Another paper, which is uh, targeted on full shape measurements from galaxies and quasars. And this paper presents uh, the, the fits to this uh, power spectrum data using CZFT models and, uh, and also studies the impact of uh, observational systematics and uh, theoretical systematics on the measurements. This paper was led by Hector Rimarin and Pauline Zarouk, who are presenting now uh, the results. And the last paper is about the cosmological constraints we could obtain from these uh, full shape measurements. And that was led by Dragan, uh, Mustafa, and Ivan. So I'm going to start describing these slides, which are essentially uh, a description of the, um, uh, the previous paper number five, which is just describing the way the data is being analyzed. <clears throat> So uh, let's start from the catalog, which is represented on the top left. So we have this catalog that has been described already by Arnaud, uh, different redshift 
right? So we have uh, for each of these Redshift bins, then we have essentially a sub catalog or um, right targeting a type of galaxies, ELGs, RGs, quasars, private galaxy surface. So for each of these catalogs, what, what we are doing is measuring the galaxy power spectrum, which is just the Fourier transform of the two point correlation function. So this first step is already a compression because we are essentially going for millions of millions of galaxies or positions in terms of angles and redshifts to just uh, tens of measurements as a function of scale of the monopole and polypole. So we are essentially doing this first compression of all the data into these two point statistics. So if, if the data were purely Gaussian field, the, that compression would be optimal. So all the information, all the statistical information on this data would be contained in the two point function. In reality, the data is not Gaussian. So there is extra information in other correlators like bi spectrum, tri spectrum, but we are not considering those on this uh, analysis. We are just focusing on the two point statistic. So from here, we want to get and get some cosmological constraints on parameters of interest, which are typically the lambda CDM parameters or the W not W A CDM parameters or whatever other model with some parameters. Is, is all of the richest space information present in the quadrupole or? So we would have considered the hexadecapole, which is like the next uh, order of interest quadrupole, but we are not doing that in this paper. We have some reasons to not doing that. There are like cons and pros for not including the hexadecapole, but in the end, we decided not to. This means that we are discarding uh, some information, but in most of the cases, this information is not relevant. So th there are different ways we can do from going to from this power spectrum multiples to cosmology. So the most easy way of thinking is, okay, we have our data, we have our P of K data, and then we have a model of that predicts this P of K as a function of a several parameters. So we just need a covariance and then we just fit the data, right? I mean, we have to incorporate the selection function as well and other, some more technical stuff, but that's it, right? A simple fitting data, and then we get the constraints, right? So this is what, what we are going to be referring as full modeling approach or direct fitting. But there are other ways of going from this power spectrum to the cosmological constraint. And this is what actually what we were doing in the past with SDSS. Instead of going directly from the power spectrum to the cosmological constraint, then let's take an intermediate step. So we do an extra compression step on the power spectrum, and then we go from P of K as a function of scale and multiples and everything into just a few uh, set of parameters per redshift, which uh, that can be three, four, five, depending on your compression scheme. And then from these compressed parameters, then let's do a final step and then let's find the cosmological interpretation in terms of a model. It might look like we are complicating ourselves because why we just do another extra compression if we just end up having the same uh, inference. So the reason is that we don't know the actual model of the universe. It could be lambda CDM, but it could be K CDM, it could be W not W A CDM. So for each new model, you have to iterate and do this iteration step of this fitting in terms of the power spectrum on the model. And this fitting is slow because it has to go, has to converge. It's an intensive analysis. So the advantage of doing this compression is that this step, this second step between the power spectrum and the compressed parameters is model agnostic. So we don't need to assume a, an actual model. We are compressing the parameters. So this is actually what BEO does. So the, for the BEO, the compressed parameters is just the this um, alpha parallel and alpha perpendicular uh, parameters, which are just the scaling uh, parameters in terms of the angular and uh, radial directions. For full shape, this is a bit more complicated because we are not extracting only information on the video, but I will just go in a minute in, into describing this. So the important thing here to retain is that in this other model, this first step is model agnostic. So we don't need to assume an actual model. And it's just in the final step that we need to assume a model to infer the cosmological parameters. Right. So for the, for the video, we have said the compressed parameters is alpha parallel and alpha perpendicular, which are described in green. And what these are doing physically is just moving the, mo the model uh, left and right. So they are essentially redefining this uh, argument K in terms of uh, this uh, K divided by alpha. 
So there is an extra information on the full uh, shape, which is the um, amplitude of the quadrupole related to the amplitude of the monopole, which are essentially Rechner space distortions. And this is parameterized through uh, F sigma 8 or F sigma S8, which is slightly different, but essentially is uh, F is the growth of a structure, sigma uh, 8 or sigma S8 is the um, amplitude of the durations uh, smooth at a certain scale. And in, 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 in the past, in SDSS and BOS and EVOS, we were essentially doing this. We were considering as a compressed parameter this alpha parallel alpha perpendicular plus F sigma 8 when we were doing a full shape. The thing is, if you do this, you don't get exactly the same constraints as if you do the direct fit because you're losing some information. There is some information that is beyond these scaling parameters and beyond these uh, rest space distortion parameters. And this uh, extra bit of information is coming from the shape of the power spectrum. And the way to visualize this is like uh, there is this freedom of changing the slope of the power spectrum. So this is what is represented with this red uh, arrow. So these extra parameters M and N, although we will only work with one because both of them, they are very degenerated. They change this, the shape, but in a slightly different way. But just consider just M as a, as a shape parameter. So in combination with the BO parameters and the Rechner space distortion parameters, then we can check whether with this compression, we recover the direct fit. And this is what is uh, shown in the next slide. I mean, the main advantage, I would say, is that you are essentially separating by physical processes. So if you're under CDM, I mean, you have like early time physics and late time physics and all is mixed up. So the shape of the power spectrum is, is a combination of both. It's a combination of what happened in the early universe, which is essentially transfer function, and what happens in the late universe, which is right space distortions and other stuff. And everything is mixed up in that signal. And, and your, the parameters of your lambda CDM is just not separating among them. It's just omega matter is omega matter. And there is a, an impact on omega matter from early universe and from late universe, but all, all is mixed up. If you do this physical approach, this is much easier to separate between physical processes and late time processes. So for instance, F sigma eight is, is essentially F, it's coming from growth of structure. So it's a late physical process. Sigma 8 is true, so it's essentially affected by the primordial uh, initial conditions. And then the scaling parameters, alpha pi alpha perpendicular, are late time processes because essentially, depending on how your expansion history is, then you will have uh, an evolution of the BO when you analyze this in a wrong cosmology, slightly off with the prediction. And M is a slope, is essentially describing a transfer function. So it's an early time process. So it's a, it's a very modular because you can check whether what early time physics of your model tells is consistent with the late time physics. And you see whether there is a tension or not. So just as a comparison, uh, we wanted to make sure that this compression was uh, optimal. So we were not losing information. So on the left triangle plot, what we are doing is essentially the constraints on, on, on some uh, synthetic data using this uh, shape fit compression approach, which is essentially uh, alpha parallel, alpha perpendicular, F sigma 8 plus this shape parameter, M. Uh, whereas the what is called template is what we were doing previously for uh, BOSS and, and EBOSS. It was just uh, ignoring this M parameter and then just doing compression in terms of alpha parallel, alpha perpendicular, and F sigma. So essentially the shape fit represents like a generalization of this uh, old compression template fit in terms of a new parameter, which was set to zero previously. And on the right-hand side plot, what we have is a comparison in terms of the parameters of the Lambda CDM model of these two approaches or three approaches. So on one half, on one half, on one side, we have the full modeling approach, which is this direct fit and is by definition extracting all the potential information. And then we have the template approach, which was only considering these three compressed variables. And then you see how much you're losing information in a certain uh, directions. And then you can fix this loss of information by essentially promoting the template to shape fit and including this extra uh, shape parameter M. And then you see how your constraints go back to what the full model predicts. This, this source of information that Hector mentioned is really when we don't combine our uh, large scale structure measurements with uh, CMB uh, data. 
as long as we combine with CMB, the three approaches uh, perform the same, at least for uh, Lambda CDM. But here, uh, the idea is really to try to extract all the constraining power from just uh, large scale structure measurements without combining with CMB. And in that case, shape fit and full modeling perform the same as Hector say for lambda, uh, said for lambda CDM and template uh, approaches loses some information. But the reason why we, we did both approaches and the reason why also eventually our uh, baseline results uh, are going to be uh, using the full modeling approach is because uh, we want to also constrain beyond lambda CDM models. And there we are not 100% uh, sure that uh, shape fit uh, uh, is uh, as constraining as full modeling for beyond lambda CDM models. This is going to be uh, work uh, for the future. I mean, uh, I guess with uh, the, the phrase beyond lambda CDM kind of describes the problem that you, once you go beyond lambda CDM, you could go beyond in a continuous infinity of different directions. So coming up with a shape fit that will work for all continuous infinity is next to impossible. But I guess you could have certain classes of beyond lambda CDM. And in each class, there'd be a particular beyond uh, a shape fit that, that would work. Exactly. Yeah. This, this plot on the left kind of shows exactly what I think you were saying on the previous slide, Hector, that uh, by having these different parameters, you are isolating different physical effects because on the left, you introduced M and nothing changed, right? Like the, the, the value you measure for alpha perpendicular, alpha per parallel hasn't changed. So it's somehow measuring something completely different. And if you only looked at the left, you'd think, well, what's the point? M is a completely useless parameter. It's not helping in any way. And then you look on the right and it's like, okay, actually it's helping significantly. So it is clearly measuring something physical that is completely uncorrelated to alpha perpendicular and alpha parallel. So let's focus now on the different models that, that we could use to predict the power spectrum, that that could be both used for full modeling and uh, shape fit. We are going to refer generically as full modeling and uh, any compressed parameter estimation as uh, full shape. So full shape means like everything. It's a generic name we just invented to refer to that. So we in DESI, we just use effective field theory models, but they are different, slightly different ways of coding, of coding this up. And we were exploring uh, different codes that account for these uh, different um, effective field theory approaches. We, we already published these papers uh, back in April, describing the codes of Velocileptos, Folks, and Fiber, which are all of them predicting uh, the power spectrum in, uh, in Fourier space. So, so two-point statistics in Fourier space, the power spectrum. And then in addition to that, we also have uh, another configuration space model, which is uh, in, in configuration space in two-point statistics. So first thing we wanted to do is to check whether these codes were agreeing with each other in terms of prediction. So what we did is to took uh, an envoy simulations uh, with a very large effective volume. So way, way larger than, than DESI uh, of two uh, gigaparsec cube, over H cube. And then we ask uh, these different codes to do a, a direct fit on the lambda CDM parameters, omega matter, H, and AS, and then check the outputs. And this is what is represented in this triangle plot. So you see that there are like slightly differences between the, the, the three different codes. So for the Velociraptors, also we just represented like two versions of it, uh, the Lagrangian and the Eulerian. Uh, there are like slightly different ways of parameterizing the bias parameters, but um, essentially it's, it's, it's the same code. So for all of these uh, three or, or four uh, versions of the codes, we check that the predictions are very, very, very good agreement. There are like some differences, but taking into account that the error bars that we are representing here, they correspond to this 200 gigaparsec cube. So this is way, way larger than the observable volume of the universe. So these differences in, in codes, they are going to be negligible when we apply these to actual uh, realistic volumes like this. So, so the fact that say the measurement of AS with the green velocileptors LPT is one sigma off the reference value. That is one sigma as measured statistically by the simulation, but that might be 0.1 sigma of DESI. Exactly. So in a nutshell, we are not going to go into these different models, but they all share like a similar pattern of structure. So they have the perturbation theory term that is quite similar to the perturbative models we were using for BOSS and EBOSS. And this essentially describes the linear and the quasi-linear physics. 
And then we have uh, an extra term, which is what we call counter term contribution, which is represented in orange here. And then these term arise because we are essentially truncating uh, the perturbative orders. So these perturbation theory terms, they are corresponds to loop integrals that they extend to infinity. They are integrals over the range of the scales. Uh, they go from very large scales, which would correspond to k equals zero, to very, 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 very small scales, so infinitely small scales, uh, that would correspond to k equal infinity. And because we cannot perform this analytical, in well, this, this integral essentially diverge because the, the growth of the structure is just perturbative when a delta is, or the over density is small, but then once it's not small anymore, then, then this perturbation theory breaks down. So a way to work for account for that is just to truncate these integrals up to a certain scale and then just resume what is beyond this scale and then put uh, a parameter in front of that, which is what we refer as counter term. And then on the top of that, we also have uh, stochastic contributions, which are arising from the halo galaxy connection and, for instance, fingers of God and things like that, they are contained in these stochastic terms. So for each of these uh, different models, then what we are predicting is the multiples of the power spectrum. So the power is monopole, quadrupole, and hexadecapole. Uh, but for this baseline analysis that, that we describe here in this paper, we just uh, refer to the two first uh, non-zero non multiples, which are the monopole and the quadrupole. So in total, this means that we are going to have uh, three galaxy bias parameters contained within the perturbation theory term, and then plus two counter terms, which are in orange, and then plus two stochastic terms that are in, in purple. So the terms multiplying the mu to the four, they will appear for the hexadecapole. But since we are not considering the hexadecapole here, then the alpha two and the NS four, they are not entering the prediction for the monopole and quadrupole. So on the top of these uh, nuisance parameters, then we will have the cosmological parameters that essentially define the linear power spectrum form that can be either compressed parameters or the parameters of our model, then plus the growth of a structure, which is a derived parameter for the lamb CDM, W0, WA, or is a free parameter for uh, shape fit and all the compressed uh, approaches, then plus these Alkopaczynski parameters or the scaling parameters that they are essentially uh, accounting for the fact that we are creating or generating our galaxy catalog based on redshift and angles in a catalog on moving distances, and we are choosing a priori cosmology. So if this cosmology is not the true cosmology, or, or we want to marginalize over this arbitrary choice, then we introduce these uh, scaling parameters, alpha pi and alpha perpendicular, that they are entering as well into the model. So I just wanted to maybe say something about the kind of effective field theory approach. Like someone looking at this might feel a little skeptical that like we don't understand what's happening on the nonlinear scales, and you are just sort of cutting off this cutting off this integral you're saying, but the integral is divergent. And so it might feel that how, how can they get away with doing this? And, and I guess the answer is that this is correct, this equation that, that's here, if certain kind of principles are satisfied, one of them would be locality. And if it's true that if on the nonlinear scales, something at one point could drastically affect something on the other side of the universe, this equation wouldn't be true. So there are certain principles that will be valid and then this effective field theory equation will be true. And so then you don't need to know the nonlinear physics precisely. You just need to know that it's not going to do anything drastic like Lorentz violation or, or non-locality or you don't know the values of the parameters because you don't know what's happening on the nonlinear scales, but you do know the form because you know or, or are, are assuming that certain things don't happen on, on the nonlinear scales. So another uh, important point about BESI is that the, uh, is the first time a uh, uh, Redshift Galaxy Survey is analyzed blindly. I mean, BO, BO analysis was blind, but this also is also blind, means, which means that um, we decided all our baseline choices, we tweak all our catalogs, etc. We do a lot of pre-processing, but all this was done without knowing the actual answer of our analysis. So we were not affected by uh, this confirmation bias. So essentially, oh, the universe looks strange. Let's start changing things until it looks lambda CDM, and then we publish our results, right? So we were doing this as a separate step. 
so the way we were blinding is we were essentially applying a processing to the catalog. So we were imprinting like fake signals in the catalog that were making the catalog not looking as Lambda CDM on purpose. So if we were analyzing the catalog under this blinding scheme, then we would naturally not look as Lambda CDM or the chosen Lambda CDM model. So the first thing is this uh, geometrical Alkopachinsky shift that was already described in the, in the VO paper, which is very simple. It's just making this uh, transformation from redshift to commoving distances using a certain cosmology that we don't reveal. So we give ourselves the uh, catalog in terms of um, commoving distances, if you want to think of it in this way, and we don't tell you how we have done this change on, uh, on redshift, right? So that, that was just doing a change or a blind in, at the background level. So it, it blinds the expansion history but it doesn't blind redshift space distortion because redshift space distortion happens at perturbation level. So in order to imprint uh, like a blinding in the, in, the pertur in, in the, at the perturbation level, we have to do something a bit more tricky. And what we did is we applied as well shifts in redshifts, but the, these shifts were essentially position dependent and they were dependent on the density of that position. So in that sense, we were imprinting like a fake Redshift space distortion signal to the to the galaxy. So with these two shifts, we were only shifting redshift. Remember, we are not changing the angular positions because we are a redshift survey. So we don't consider the angular positions uh, a key element of our analysis. The key thing or the new thing is the redshift. So this is what we blind. And we have these two blindings that, that we apply uh, at the same time, uh, and we also remove them at the same time. And these two blindings, they don't have to be coherent. So in that sense, the omega matter that the Alkopachinsky wants, so the omega matter that the background cosmology wants, is not necessarily the same as the omega matter that the precious space distortion wants. So in that sense, if you try to analyze this without thinking it's blind, it might look like some modified gravity thing or something like that. With the unblinding, you said they were unblinded at the same time. So were both of these unblinded before the BAO papers in April or? That was this uh, period where the VEO paper was being written and the catalog has been unblinded, but we were not looking at that unblinded catalog with the full shape analysis. So at, during some period of time, they existed two catalogs, the blinded catalog and the unblinded catalog, but there were strict rules that we could not look at unblinded catalog uh, for any uh, full shape analysis until the, this unblinding was also declared on, on, the, on the full shape. So um, I already mentioned, or we already mentioned that on the volume effect. So um, let's, here we have just a couple of slides that they are describing this. So first of all, these are like the, what we call prior volume effects. And this happens essentially when your data is not constraining enough, given the model you apply in terms of parameter space, right? So these are like the typical thing that you have like very elongated bananas in the two dimensional parameters where your maximum a posteriori, it's not located at the same time of the mean. And this is illustrated in this uh, slide with the, with the blue point. So for instance, we are trying here to constrain uh, a W0WA -W CDM model. So with uh, quite a lot of freedom in terms of parameters. And if we apply only the SE data, then we see that the mean, which is the solid dot, and the two sigma errors, they are not close at all to the maximum of the posterior. So this means that the results in these cases are very, very difficult to interpret what they mean, right? So this essentially is not nice for us because we definitely can do this analysis, but it's hard to say what the universe is telling us because the one would expect that the mean and the maximum a posteriori, they coincide very close to each other, but here it's not. So as long as we are more data sets and this is like orange, green, and uh, pink, then we get that our data is more and more constraining given this model. And therefore we have both map and mean in agreement to each other. So that's a, a, an issue we have, but typically what 
when your data is not constraining enough on your model, then you don't have anything to say about that model given that data, right? So these are like situations that you probably don't don't want to be, and you only want to analyze when your data is constraining enough. Even in one D, you can imagine how this would happen if you have a very sharp peak and then a very long, 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 long tail. Asymmetric non-Gaussian distributions, for instance, or a double peak thingy, or something like that. Yes. The data point with error bar kind of thing really only makes sense if the distribution is Gaussian, right? Otherwise, it's not. It's not telling you what you think it's telling you. So, so if the statistical distribution is not Gaussian, we probably shouldn't be showing that. Sh should we not then be doing like a, a maximum likelihood point plus like a 95% thing around that, which would then, you would have the, the open circle in the center and then yeah, maybe 95% confidence interval right next to it on one side and then very far away on the other side. And th then you can still make a, a meaningful statement, can't you? Yes, you could, but then it's it, because you have to report just not one parameter, but like a several, then you have to also report the full correlations among them. So these start to be tricky to essentially interpret what it means. The easiest thing is to just try to be in situations where your data is more informative, if you want to say something about that model. It's not informativeness that's the key here, right? It's it's asymmetric skew, right? Like you... When your data is informative, then you end up being in a Gaussian situation. Oh, if that if that statement is true, then I agree. But why is that true? Why, why is... I mean, we can generate uh, synthetic data with uh, more volume, and then we see that with high enough volume, then we end up converging. So it doesn't seem it's something intrinsic on the model. It's just that the issue is that the data is not informative. Okay. Is, is this maybe something to do with the central limit theorem that like if, if the actual limiting stuff is a whole bunch of statistical errors, they are going to be Gaussian, whether each individual area is Gaussian or yes. not. Once you put them all together, the combination is going to be Gaussian. Yes. But here you've got very strong effects on some prior that has some physical reason why it cuts off very sharply at some value. And then, then you get a highly non-Gaussian um, posterior because of the highly non-Gaussian prior. I guess maybe that's unpacking everything. Why? So there is there are ways of fixing this, which is I mean essentially all these most of these volume prior effects they are arising because of counter terms. So in that sense, if we put um, a prior informative enough on these counter terms, then these uh, prior volume effects are reduced, right? So you are tempted to essentially instead of putting a flat uh, informative an informative prior, then you put some Gaussian around that, right? And then you won't suffer anymore on the or you will suffer way less on these prior volume effects. Then there is this second effect, which we are referring to as a prior weight effect, which is the effect of putting a very tight prior on a parameter that differs from what the actual data wants to be, right? So you could essentially try to infer this parameter based on simulations or mocks, but then your data might be different from these simulations and mock. And then when you put a prior, then you are forcing the system to be in a place it doesn't want to be for this uh, counter term. And then therefore the system is compensating by shifting systematic on a, on a cosmological parameter of your interest. And this is what is illustrated uh, here. So when, when, you, when you go from these uh, Gaussian counter terms uh, to, to, sorry, for these flat priors to Gaussian priors, then you get a bit better behavior. Uh, and then if you just increase the volume of your data way, way higher. So this V25 means uh, this uh, 200 gigaparsec over H cube volume, then you don't have these differences anymore. So how does one come up with physically motivated Gaussian pariahs for these counter terms? Right, so the idea is that these counter terms should not change the overall signal by a certain percent at a certain scale. So in that sense, if you fix like the cutoff scale as a scale of reference, k equal 0.2 h over megaparsecs, and then the, you have to impose that the contribution from this counter term part to the overall signal, it should not be much larger than a certain uh, contribution of the perturbation theory part. So we are comparing essentially here the blue and the orange sums on the previous uh, slide I showed before. 
So you don't you don't want here to the orange part to be the dominant parts over the blue part at a certain scale because then it would mean that your theory doesn't seem to be converging to something. It's just it's dominated by this truncation scale, which would be naturally not nice. It's just an assumption. It doesn't necessarily has to be true, but we have been working with that. Yeah, it's, I think it's, yeah, it's, it's the general idea that high order terms in the perturbation theory should contribute less than the lead than the leading order. Otherwise, there is a, some mistake in your uh, in your in the way you uh, elaborate it in your your theory. But what Hector was saying is that the actual value of the priors, the, the width of the priors, uh, has some. Uh, it's not uh, set in stone. I mean, we we did, we we tried to be uh, uh, not too conservative, so that uh, we 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 are pretty confident that we can impose Gaussian priors. And there was a lot of discussion about the width of the priors, and we did an extensive test on for comparing different choices for the width of the priors against simulations, so that we can find a compromise between uh, adopting a prior that uh, is physically motivati motivated but not uh, too informative, so that it biases uh, our cosmological constraints. Yeah, so now we'll continue with the, the study of the potential sources of the systematic effects. To do that, uh, we used uh, realistic uh, n body uh, simulations. So, Hector already mentioned uh, the work we did to uh, quantify the uh, uncertainties related to the theoretical modeling given uh, the framework of the effective field theory. And we did again uh, this exercise uh, with uh, our uh, realistic uh, DR1 simulation with the footprint and the, the uh, uh, precision of the, our year one measurements. We also uh, uh, studied the uh, what we call uh, the galaxy halo connection and how uh, theoretical models cap can capture variations in the this in the way we populate uh, dark matter halos uh, with uh, galaxies in our simulations. We also have a potential source of systematic effects related to the fiducial cosmology, which uh, the choice of fiducial cosmology enters at uh, two levels. It enters at the level of uh, constructing the catalog, as uh, Hector said, we need to assume uh, fiducial cosmology to transform uh, redshift into commoving distances to compute uh, our two-point statistics. And for shape fit, we also need to assume uh, fiducial uh, cosmology when we compute the uh, fiducial uh, linear power spectrum at a fixed template. So this uh, second um, way fiducial cosmology enters is only for shape fit and not for the full modeling approach. We discussed also already a lot uh, the fiber assignment uh, effect. And uh, we, I, we, I will show just uh, one, two slides, uh, the effect on our uh, two-point statistics and, uh, and how to correct for it. We all, there, there is also inhomogeneities in the target selection. So the, num the number density of the galaxies can vary according to some uh, uh, photometric quantities during uh, target selection, such as uh, the stellar density, the galactic extinction, things like that, that we need to account for because otherwise it creates uh, spurious effects, uh, spurious correlations in our two-point statistics. And uh, we also quantified uh, the uncertainties related to spectroscopic redshift failures and uh, spectroscopic uncertainties. And eventually we need a covariance matrix um, to do our, uh, our fitting. And there we compared two approaches, a mock-based approach using uh, approximate uh, simulations and an analytic approach. So a first um, a systematic effect uh, we wanted to highlight is uh, the galaxy halo connection, just as an illustration of another modeling systematics. And here the idea is, as I said, to try to uh, quantify how well a theoretical models uh, capture galaxy clustering under different assumptions about galaxy formation. And uh, so for this galaxy halo connection, we use the uh, framework of a halo occupancy distribution, which is a probabilistic uh, framework, which uh, where basically, so the idea is that we have a dark matter simulation with dark matter halos that we need to populate with uh, galaxies. And we have a different uh, uh, probability uh, function to, for a dark matter halo to host a central galaxy or to host a satellite galaxy. 
And basically the idea is that uh, we can uh, generate simulations with uh, different uh, parameters for this uh, HOD uh, uh, prescription. And, uh, and we want to see the impact on our uh, two-point uh, statistic measurements. Here, for instance, you have uh, on the left uh, the power spectrum uh, monopole and quadrupole for the uh, different uh, HOD models for the allergies in, in red. And uh, in, uh, on the right, you have the different uh, power spectrum measurements, monopole and quadrupole for the, uh, EL, for the ELG models. And so you can see that there are some variations and we want to account for that effect in our cosmological constraints. The new thing uh, with this um, uh, study, uh, in particular for Galaxy Halo Connection, is that instead of uh, propagating an uncertainty at the level of the cosmological parameters or the shape fit parameters, so saying, okay, the measurements on F sigma 8 is statistical error plus uh, systematic error coming from a Galaxy Halo Connection, we propagate the uh, uncertainties at the level of the power spectrum measurement, so at the, dat at the data vector level. And here you have, uh, uh, again, for LRG on the left and ELG on the right, the HOD uh, error, so the cross the points with uh, error bars. The gray uh, uh, region is the uh, year one uh, statistical, uh, DR1 statistical error, and then the color, the addition of the color, the line is uh, the DR1 statistical error plus HOD. And what we did is that uh, when we when uh, doing the cosmological fits, we propagated this error at the covariance at the level, so at the data at the data vector level, so that our measurements include the effect of uh, our two-point statistic measurements include the effect of of, of HOD. And given that we are doing full modeling uh, constraints, then we, we, it can be applied to uh, any uh, cosmological model. Of course, we also did the comparison when we quantify the uh, systematic error on the parameter. But when we do that in a full modeling approach, as Hector said, it's model dependent. So the statistical error we are going to quote on the parameter, on the lambda CDM param on the parameters, is not necessarily going to apply to another um, cosmological model, W not WA. So with this way of um, reporting systematic uncertainty at the data vector le level, we can uh, treat any cosmological model. So when you're doing the actual kind of, you've got your full yeah, data vector, the parameters that Hector listed in the effective field theory are all of them. There's not new parameters coming from what you're describing now. But what you're describing now is just a way of understanding the error in, in doing that. Yes, exactly. Another systematic uh, to highlight and that uh, Arno has already uh, described is the, uh, fi the, the systematic associated with a fiber assignment. So uh, I'm just going to, to, to re recall what uh, Arno said. So because of uh, uh, the way we, we assign uh, fibers to, spec to, to galaxies and the fact that we are going to uh, take the spectra of a limited uh, set of uh, galaxies. We have group of galaxies that are too close to each other to, 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 so that uh, each uh, galaxy can receive a fiber. And this is uh, determined also by the size of the positioner patrol uh, diameter, uh, which is 0 0.05 degree. So, it, so for that reason, it means that uh, 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 correlations, angular correlations at scales below that, uh, that uh, positional patrol diameter are going to be um, mainly affected by this effect. We are going to have a, a lack of power, basically, uh, because we miss uh, correlations, because we, we haven't put a fiber at all the galaxies we should have if we were not limited by that. So the way we decided to correct for that effect is to apply a cut in angular scale and remove the, the, the pair below 0 0.05 degree. And in, this, uh, in, the, in the plot on the, on the right, you can see the uh, effects. So it's not exactly the correlation function, but it's a ratio of the data of the random uh, pair counts with uh, and without the effect uh, on the data uh, solid line and uh, on the uh, most realistic version of the simulation we have for this effect this alt and tl 
And uh, as you can see indeed that most of the effect is removed when removing the small angular uh, pairs. It has an impact, of course, on the uh, power spectrum measurements. And this is what uh, you can see here for the monopole, uh, quadrupole, and hexadecapole. So as Hector said, uh, eventually we didn't consider the hexadecapole, but here this is uh, shown for, for completeness. And you have uh, in solid line uh, the mock uh, without any fiber assignment effect, what we call the complete mocks. And in a dashed line, the alt MTL mock, basically the most realistic fiber assigned uh, simulations. And you can clearly see the effect uh, on the monopole and quadrupole and hexadecapole, mainly the first two multipoles. And then you have uh, this correction applied uh, in red, the theta cut, the cut in angular scale for both the complete and alt MTL mock, so mock with and without fiber assignment. And eventually this correction, uh, this uh, solution of removing the pairs, uh, uh, allows us to uh, recover uh, an unbiased uh, clustering measurements. So there are a lot of other uh, systematics that uh, I, uh, I haven't uh, mentioned in detail, but it was just to give uh, two, two examples, one which is more a modeling effect and another one which is more an observational uh, effect. Eventually, our total systematic error uh, is about uh, two-fifths of the uh, DR1 statistical error, mainly coming from uh, the... Uh, uh, uncertainty related uh, galaxy halo connection and inhomogeneities in the target selection uh, that I haven't described. So would that mean that in the DR2, the three-year data, this two-fifths will become more and more substantial as the statistical error drops? But are there prospects for reducing this with more data? or Exactly, especially, about, uh, especially regarding the inhomogeneities in the target selection. Although there have been a, a lot of improvement in the way we account for this effect in this DR1 analysis, it's going to be further improved for uh, the analysis with uh, the three-year sample. It's not an issue for DR1, but the goal is that it's not a limiting factor for uh, the analysis with a three-year sample. So to summarize our pipeline, our full shape pipeline, so we are, the observable uh, is the power spectrum monopole and quadrupole. We are using an effective field theory model. The covariance here is a mock based one. We have also compared with uh, analytic. Our fitting range is between 0.02 and 0.2 with K uh, red number. And eventually uh, we have, uh, so this is summarized in the table on, on, on the left, we have uh, five lambda CDM parameters. So this is for full modeling, uh, four compressed parameters for shape fit, and seven non-cosmological parameters where we have the galaxy bias parameters. We have three galaxy bias parameters two counter terms and two stochastic terms, as uh, Hector uh, mentioned. Regarding the uh, systematic error, as I said, we included them at the data vector level instead of uh, as previously done at the parameter level. And in this figure, so this is just for one bin of the uh, LRG, but uh, in the paper, you will see the other redshift bins. We compared the previous approach of including the uh, systematic errors at the parameter level, uh, which is the field uh, contours, and with the uh, systematic error included at the data vector level, uh, which is the solid uh, curves. And you can see that they are both uh, consistent. And the, the reason why we do it at the, at the data vector level, again, is because we are doing a full modeling approach where, as our baseline results. And by including the errors uh, at, in the covariance directly, it can be propagated to any cosmological model. You've got the four cosmological parameters here. I guess the fifth one is Omega Baryon. I'm, I'm just asking a completely out of left field question here. How, how is, is anything that you guys measure particularly sensitive to Omega Baryon or is it just sitting there because it's part of Lambda CDM? Yeah, it's completely dominated by our uh, BVN prior. Is it like the summary of what's new in terms of SDSS with respect to DESI? So first of all, the spectroscopic sample is, is bigger in terms of traces and volume. Uh, unlike SDSS, we have done a blind analysis to mitigate this confirmation bias. Uh, and this blind analysis is done at the catalog level, which represents like a very strong uh, blinding uh, against accidental blinding. Uh, we have used effective theory models uh, instead of the old uh, perturbation theory. So 
uh, we have included now counter terms and stochastic terms. And then we have both performed like two parallel analysis, two parallel full shape analysis, one in terms of a direct fit in full modeling and the other in, in terms of shape fit. Although our final results are in terms of full modeling, both look very consistent. And we have improved like uh, the treatment uh, in terms of systematic uh, observational errors as, as the fiber assignment, for example, as Pauline was, was explaining. So uh, as, a, as a DESI product, we have like produced not only this uh, data, but also like a full pipeline that we are allowing the community to repeat our analysis and tweaks and change and tweaks uh, slightly the assumptions we were making just to be transparent and be reproducible. So our results are going to be just like publicly available and also the pipeline is going to be publicly available. So I hope the community can really look at our results and, and play around with them. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to present uh, like the very straightforward results in terms of uh, these full modeling measurements uh, in terms of the BEO. And then I know we'll continue with the more detailed results. So in Lambda CDM model, what you can get as a new thing is constraints on sigma eight in terms of omega matter. So both sigma eight and well, sigma eight is not constrained on BO. Sigma matter is as omega matter is constrained from the BO, but with full shape analysis, this constraint on omega matter are, are getting better. So here we are showing just the full modeling constraints on the BGS sample. And we are just plotting in terms of omega matter and sigma eight. We are employing a BBM prior and, and NS prior 10 times the size of Planck. Uh, and then we are repeating this analysis just with the LRGs as an independent analysis. So we are doing fits on cosmology independently on BGS, the first LRG bin, the second LRG. And then you see as you go on on the following slides that all measurements, they look consistent as you increase the redshift bins. And then finally, you can do a full modeling fit to all of them at the same time. So this is not like a naive combination of the contours, it's just a full fit to all of them at the same time. And this is represented by the black contour on the right panel. And then you can extend this combined fit to sigma to H naught as well. So this is on the left panel. So here you see the complementarity of the full modeling analysis because you had in, in orange the fit from, from the BO, expansion history from the BO, where you were constraining H naught and omega matter. And then by including this full shape, it is in blue, in yeah, it's in blue. Then in combination with the BO, then you get the black contour. So you see how the background with the perturbation, they are very complementary. And in terms of lambda CDM with these two external priors on omega baryon and NS, then we get these constraints on omega matter, which is around 0.30 with a precision of 3.2% and sigma 8 around 0.84 with a 4% precision and then an H naught, which is on 68.5 with around 1% precision. So we've just seen uh, daisy constraints um, with this um, BBN likelihood and uh, this prion NS. But uh, now let's see how these daisy constraints compared to constraints from other surveys, other samples. So to perform this comparison, we'll use this um, S8 parameter, which is a combination of the sigma 8 parameter, so it's basically the amplitude of, of perturbations and omega m. And, uh, and we're using this parameter because uh, this is um, the parameter which is best constrained, uh, best constrained by weak lensing surveys. So at the bottom, you see the constraint we obtained from uh, DAISY uh, alone, but with this BBN likelihood and S prior. Uh, so let's see how this compares to other surveys. Here I've added uh, the measurement from the SDSS. So that was the previous uh, uh, largest spectroscopic data set we had. And uh, you see that we are very much consistent with, uh, with the measurement from, uh, from SDSS. So again, uh, I've just uh, to, uh, to mention that the Analysis technique is, is a bit different from the SDSS, as we have seen. Uh, here in this case, we're using full modeling, so we're directly fitting cosmological parameters, and we are not using this compression step. And also in SDSS, we had a, a slightly reduced version of shape fits, where we only had CZF sigma 8 and, uh, and alpha parameters um, 
uh, compared to shapefit. So we had a slightly different analysis. We also in SDSS, we used the only perturbation theory models, not including these, uh, these EFT terms. So yes, the analysis is a bit different, but what we see here is that in terms of cosmological constraints, this e is, uh, is totally consistent with SDSS. In a range, I'm showing the constraints that are derived from the CMB, assuming they land the CDM model. And uh, CMB and L stands for CMB without lensing, no lensing. For this, we've used the uh, PR3 data and specifically the, the, the likely use for it by the Planck collaboration in 2018. And for the CMB constraints, so that is including uh, CMB lensing, we use for CMB lensing part, we use uh, this combination of Planck PR4 and ACDR6 data. And uh, specifically, this is new, uh, this is likely used by, uh, by the ACT collaboration. So we see that uh, these constraints are perfectly compatible with the CMB constraints. And in green, we see constraints obtained with weak lensing measurements that are known to prefer a lower S8 at a significance which depends on the analysis. We've seen in more recent analysis as discrepancy with the CMB inferred uh, value of, uh, of S8 has reduced a bit. Uh, so this is a big fluctuance, but what we see in any way for, for what uh, is important uh, to us is that DESI is also compatible with these uh, weak lensing surveys. In, in some ways you're being unfair to DESI here by plotting a plot that is the parameter that is best constrained by weak lensing surveys. I, I presume there'd be an equivalent S something that is the best DESI one. Well, actually with DESI, I mean, with spectroscopic surveys, we can constrain both and omega M and sigma I at the same time, because we can get omega M very precisely from the BA only part rate and, uh, and sigma I from these cross rate measurements, these full shape measurements. So we can see the powers of, um, of 3D galaxy clustering that we can measure both omega M and sigma I. Sigma I and omega M are not well constrained independently by weak lensing surveys. So indeed, this is a bit unfair to, uh, to DAISY, uh, but the idea of this part is really to compare our, our measurements with, uh, with other surveys. You're saying that the green data points and the blue ones are consistent, and I, I'm happy for you to say that, and I'm happy for you to carry on, and I think you're about to combine with one of the, the green surveys. That's totally fine. But let's, let's say that I'm wanting to look at beyond lambda CDM sort of stuff here. Is it true that DESI is sensitive to larger scales than the green ones? So if I've got an alternative model that only kicks in in the very small scales, that would still be kind of consistent with the yellow and blue being to the right and the green to the left? Is that true? Or is DESI also sensitive to quite small scales? It's analysis dependent, uh, I would say, because it, it here for the full shape, for the what we refer to as the year one full shape analysis, uh, indeed, because we use a perturbation theory based model, even if it's EFT, uh, we start at scales uh, above uh, 20, 25 uh, megaparsec order H, while uh, in weak lensing surveys, usually the probe scales around uh, 5, 10 megaparsec order H. So it, and this is where they have the, the most uh, signal. But uh, DAISY can probe smaller scales as well. It's just a question of modeling. Uh, then in that case, you can't rely anymore on perturbation theory to analyze uh, your two-point statistics. But it's, what you said is true for this specific analysis. What we think is the most robust DAISY can do with your one measurements, we don't probe these small scales. So now we can look at combining DAISY with other data sets. So the first one we'll consider is this uh, DS03 six times two point data set. So six times two points times two point means uh, galaxy, 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 sheer, 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 galaxy, CMB lensing, sheer CMB lensing, and CMB lensing, CMB lensing correlations. Uh, so that we use these full likelihoods and we combine DAISY with, uh, with these data sets. So in a range, you see the posterior ob obtained with this, D this DSR3 6M2 point analysis. In blue, the one obtained from, from DAISY, and in green, that's the combination of the two. So we see that by adding DAISY, we're able to, um, to increase the precision on omega M and sigma A by a factor two uh, compared to uh, DSR3 uh, alone. Okay, so now we can combine DAISY with CMB. So in blue, you still see the same uh, DZ constraints and the uh, CMB constraints are shown in a range. In green, we've got the combination of the two. Uh, so by combining DAISY with CMB, we're able to reduce, uh, well, to increase the precision on omega M and H0 uh, by 30% uh, compared to the CMB alone, uh, the dominancy. 
And okay, so see that the constraints when we combine Daisy with the SR3, six times two points and CMB uh, no lensing because this time we already have CMB lensing into the DSR3 six times two points analysis. So we do not want to double count the data sets. And these are the very tight constraints we obtain when you combine DAISY, DSR3, six times two point and CMB no lens in green. Now let's move to uh, dark energy. So as we've seen at the beginning of, uh, of this presentation, we've obtained constraints on dark energy uh, using BAO data. So uh, we definitely want to look at uh, what they become uh, when we include full shape data. So to probe deviations to lambda CDM and uh, specifically deviations to learn those the cosmological constant, we can assume that dark energy is a fluid with a given pressure P and density rho, which are related to its equation of state parameter W. And uh, for W, as for the BAO data, we assume the CPL parameterization for this uh, dark energy equation of state parameter. Uh, so we have these two parameters, W0, WA, and the lambda CDM corresponds to W0 equals minus 1, and WA equals 0. Uh, so the third thing that we probably want to look at is to see whether the gross constraints from DAISY change uh, when we allow for this mock flexible expansion history. So here we call the constraints in the omega m sigma e plane using DAISY data with its BBN like U and minus prior within lambda CDM. That's uh, what we see in dashed lines. And what we do now is looking at the constraints in still in this omega m and sigma eight plane, but combining DAISY uh, with different supernovae data sets and in this uh, WNRWA CDM model. So we've considered three supernovae data sets, just as for the BAO. The first one is Pantheon Plus by Skolnich and Broad. The second one uh, in neural range is Union 3. And uh, the third one in green is DSU5. So what we see uh, is that in this omega m sigma a plane, we basically get similar constraints uh, with uh, the different supernovae data sets. In this is extended model, WNR, WSCDM model compared to lambda CDM. So the conclusion is basically that our sigma constraints coming from DAISY are pretty insensitive to, uh, to the expression history. We get uh, very quite stable measurements. How much of this changes when you go from BAO to full shape, or is this mostly just the BAO information still? Or? The big difference compared to BAO here is that we add constraints on sigma. So now let's look at constraints in the normal North WA plane. So these are constraints obtained by combining DAISY with CMB and Pantheon Plus data in blue. And in dashed line, I recall the contours that we obtain with, uh, with BAO, without full shape uh, information, I mean, still in combination with CMB and, and, and Pantheon Plus. We see that, again, we prefer a slightly, well, a W0, which is larger than minus 1, WA negative, just as for the BAO. And uh, so these are the constraints using Pantheon Plus, but let's look at constraints uh, using unit three data in a range and uh, DS your five uh, data in green. So the first point is that uh, in, when we include full shape data, we tighten a bit the constraints in WNRWA plane by a factor of 20%. We see the still the same preference for uh, W not larger than minus one, WA negative. And, and see the sigma that I quoted, that is uh, the preference for WNR, WACDM over, over lambda CDM is similar to the ones we obtain with BAO uh, without this uh, full shape information. Okay, so now let's move to constraints on the sum of neutrino masses. So we, uh, with BAO alone, we, I mean, with BAO and combination with CMB, uh, we had some interesting constraints on the sum of neutrino masses. And now we'll, let's look at how they improve with full shape data. So. Massive neutrinos impact the expansion history. So at, at very high redshift, they behave like radiation, but at lower redshifts, uh, as they become non-relativistic, then they count as matter, right? So, so massive neutrinos impact the expansion history in a quite peculiar way that can be constrained with BAO in combination with CMB. But massive neutrinos also impact the growth of structure. So massive neutrinos still are uh, at a high velocity, which means that they tend to smooth the structure formation on scales which are smaller than the so-called free streaming scale, which depends on the inverse uh, sum of neutrino masses. And so below this uh, is a free streaming scale. We'll have a suppression of structure compared to, uh, to larger scales um, where neutrinos behave like dark matter. Um, so, uh, and this is what we're seeing on this, on this, on this figure showing this 
uh, suppression of the power spectrum, the relative suppression of the power spectrum as a function of the neutrino mass and as a function of the, of the, um, of the scale k. And in, in gray, uh, I'm showing the uh, fitting range that uh, we're using uh, in our analysis. So that means that um, with our analysis, we will be probably sensitive to this um, suppression of power, right, that we see, probably more through, you know, the shape of the power spectrum. And maybe also we'll be sensitive to uh, the amplitude of these BOs, of these BO wiggles. We see that the, uh, the sum of neutrino masses has uh, some impact on, on the on the amplitude of BO wiggles. Uh, so now let's look at the actual constraints we obtain with busy uh, combined with this BBN likelihood and mass prior. So we are able to put a constraint on sum of neutrino masses at the point four electron volt at 95%. And this is a dashed blue contour we see on the, on, on the right, in the NS uh, sum of neutrino masses plane. But I mean, these uh, measurements on, uh, I mean, this constraint on the sum of neutrino masses is is somewhat degenerate with NS, just you know, because we are measuring the suppression of power, right? So what we can do is to apply a, a tighter prior on NS. In, in this case, we, we we take directly NS as measured from Planck uh, without a factor of 10. And so with this tighter prior on NS, we are able to, to have a better constraints at the level of uh, 0.3 electron volt at 95%. And that's what we see uh, the, the bottom right plot as a, as a solid contour. This includes all the BAO information again, is that right? Uh, yes. Uh, so BAO alone will, I mean, BAO plus BBN will not be able to put any constraints on sum of neutrino masses because uh, these just act at, uh, as, a, as a dark matter the for the expansion into sorry at late times. So yes, now let's try to combine DAISY data with other data sets and uh, of course with CMB. We know that in CMB where there is this degeneracy between the sum of neutrino masses and H0, especially in the primary CMB, the sum of neutrino masses impacts, I mean, both H0 and the sum of neutrino masses impact this, the angular uh, diameter distance to the, the CMB and, and so these two are very degenerate. They are less degenerate when we add uh, uh, CMB lensing because we see the effect of neutrinos on the growth of structure directly. So um, now we can uh, see how uh, DAISY can be combined with a CMB uh, and that's the constraints uh, we obtain in green. So in solid green, that's the constraints we obtain from DAISY, full shape plus BO in combination with a CMB. And in dash line, I just uh, remind the constraints we obtain uh, from DAISY BO plus a CMB. I just want to highlight that Back in April, we had this, uh, we claimed the point 0.072 electron volt per limit on sum of neutrino masses of 95%. Now it's uh, point 0.082 electron volt, and that comes from the fact that there has been an update in the CMB lensing likelihood. So what we are doing here is comparing uh, DAISY full shape plus BAO plus CMB uh, to this updated version of the constraints on sum of neutrino masses. Um, so this comes from, definitely we have a lot of constraining power on the expansion history that comes from the BO, and these even increase when we add full shape information, right? And we've seen that with DAISY BO already, we had a quite uh, low omega and, and high H0, and this tends to, to actually lower the upper bound of the sum of neutrino masses, as we see um, due to the degeneracy between H0 and the sum of neutrino masses. And this is still the case with full shape. So we think that's basically what is uh, driving the constraints on, on this sum of neutrino masses. Yeah, I'm a bit surprised that the full shape hasn't improved by even more. Will like the full DESI five-year data set have a much better constraint? Because as you said, the full, sh full shape, you should see this drop off in the power spectrum. Actually, once we combine with CMB, uh, the suppression of the power spectrum is really not the dominant information. It's more the constraints on the expansion history that play a role. The constraints uh, that have been presented so far on the sum of neutrino masses and other, all other constraints um, used as a Planck PS3 likelihood, uh, 2018 likelihood. But I mean, there have been updates in the Planck data. Um, so uh, there is now PS4 data and the new CMB likelihoods. And actually, the constraint that we've seen on the sum of neutrino masses are quite related to uh, the CMB, um, so-called CMB lensing LNs anomaly, uh, which is that the temperature fluctuation that we see in the CMB 
seemed a, a bit uh, too damped compared to um, to what we could expect. That is, the lensing of CMB seemed to be uh, a bit um, too high. Uh, and so, in this updated data, and uh, especially in this updated likelihood, this uh, this lens uh, a lens anomaly tends to uh, to to disappear. And uh, and so we want to see what the impact on the constraint on some of the mass is. So in blue, we see the constraint obtained with the Planck PR3 data. In orange, that obtained with the Planck PR4 data using this CAM spec likelihood. And in green, uh, using the lollipop, lollipop uh, likelihood. So we see that with this lollipop, lollipop likelihood, we get a slightly loser bound on some of the masses at around 0 0.084 electron volt compared to, uh, to what we had with the Planck PR3. So the difference is not huge. And this is mostly because we still have the CMB, uh, CMB likelihood, Planck PR4 and RTR6 uh, lensing likelihood, which tends to, um, uh, to mitigate these, um, these differences. And uh, of course, I mean, these constraints of some of the new masses are model dependent. So we can assume a more flexible expansion history model. Uh, so we can go to, uh, we can use WNR, WACDM. And uh, within this model, uh, the upper bound of some of new masses relaxes to 0.2 electron volt at 95% uh, level. And, uh, and we see the different, I mean, the constraints we obtain within this WNR, WACDM model with a different supernovae data set. So combining DESI, CMB, and uh, then the, the three supernovae data sets. So we see here that, yes, the, uh, the constraints of some of the is quite relaxed um, compared to what we had previously. Okay, now, last but not least, modified gravity. So as we've seen at the beginning of this presentation, DESI can put constraints on deviations to dark, uh, to, to, to general relativity. So, we can consider this um, Freeman Lemaitre Robertson Walker metric um, with scalar perturbations. So we've got these two gravitational potentials, psi and phi. So at late times, uh, when we can neglect uh, the anisotropic stress from uh, very uh, light species like photons and neutrinos, we have these two equations. Uh, the first one governs the trajectory of massive particles. So that's the Poisson equation. And the second one, is governing the trajectory of massless particles, so light. And we have, we have introduced these two functions, mu and sigma, which depend on the scale factor A and K. Um, and uh, in general relativity, we expect this mu and sigma to be, uh, to be one. So this mu parameter will uh, change structure formation, and this sigma parameter will change the relation between psi and phi. We know that within general relativity, psi and phi should be, uh, should be equal, and this uh, sigma parameter is, is modifying this. So for the constraint that we will show, um, I mean, of course, these uh, mu and sigma functions are very general. I mean, they depend on the scale factor A and K. But for the constraints that we will show, we'll have to assume some, um, some permutation for these functions. Uh, so for this paper, we have assumed that mu and sigma are scale independent. We remove the, the K dependence. And uh, we parameterize the, uh, the dependence of mu and sigma with, uh, with a scale factor um, as a function of the uh, fractional density of, uh, of dark energy. Uh, so lan uh, omega lambda at the uh, given scale factor A over omega lambda today. Uh, so we only have these two parameters, mu zero and sigma zero. And um, if we measure mu zero equals zero, sigma zero equals zero, that means that we've not seen any, devi any deviations uh, to general relativity. On the bottom right, I'm showing the effect of the mu zero parameter, which, which, which governs the structure formation on F sigma eight. And uh, it's quite clear that there is a huge effect on, on F sigma eight uh, with, uh, with this uh, mu zero. So with DAISY uh, alone, we'll be able to constrain this mu zero. This particular parameterization, I guess, links mu very closely to dark energy. Is that kind of the motivation for why it has this form that somehow it's Oh, yes, exactly. So we want to probe late time deviations to general relativity. So that's why we have this uh, factor, which I mean, depends on the, uh, the fraction of, of dark energy. And I guess one would hope that if there was a modification of gravity that was not linked to dark energy, that it would still show up by non-zero measurements of mu naught and sigma naught, just it wouldn't be the most sensitive parameterization. Exactly. So this is just a, you know, an, an effective parameterization. It's not, it's not something which is the, Derived, can be derived from an action 
as a true modified gravity model. But the idea here is just to probe deviations to general relativity in a rather general way. Um, so with DAISY, uh, with BBN and, uh, and Susan Asperger, we were able to constrain the mu, mu zero parameter um, at this level. So we uh, see the blue contour on the, on the right figure in this uh, sigma naught mu, mu naught plane. So I recall GR is sigma naught equals, my, equals uh, mu naught equals zero. And, uh, and with DAISY alone, we are, we are only able to constrain uh, mu naught. Um, and and, and in principle, we should have a purely horizontal uh, bar. The reason why it's truncated is just because of a, of a prior that we impose in the theory model uh, to have reliable theory predictions. So this is not related to the fact that that this is able to constrain sigma naught. This is not this is not the case. This is not open, able to constrain sigma naught. This is just a prior effect. And you've got this hashed area. Is that w w what is physically impossible about mu naught and sigma naught? This is not physically impossible per se. It's just a region where we do not trust our theory prediction. Uh, now, sigma zero uh, can be uh, constrained by CMB uh, through uh, the integrated exact Wolf effect and Lenskin, uh, because uh, this is sensitive to the path. I mean, this is, in Lessing is basically proving the path of light, which is governed, uh, which is sensitive to this uh, uh, sigma uh, sigma function. So that's why we are able to constrain sigma naught. And we can next uh, look at uh, constraints uh, from galaxy lensing, in um, and uh, and we are able to um, when we combine DESI CMB, DESI CMB and uh, DSR three data, uh, these are the constraints you obtain in purple. So compared to just CMB um, and uh, and DSR three data, uh, including DESI helps us improve the uh, the constraints on this on the mu zero by factor two point five and on sigma naught by factor two, so this is quite impressive, and we see no deviations uh, to general relativity. Yeah, it looks like the CMB alone sort of did. So somehow CMB lensing must be doing something funky because you remove the CMB lensing and everything goes to the left. But that's not for you to talk about, I guess. That's for CMB lenses to talk about. Yes, exactly. So. Yes, so this is again something which is quite related to this um, a lens anomaly in the CMB, and we've seen that this, uh, you know, this fact that the CMB tends to pre to prefer uh, a positive uh, sigma sigma zero is mitigated by PR four and uh, a new CMB like use like Lillipop and Lollipop. So this is using the two thousand eighteen likelihood here. Yes, exactly. Yes, we would have uh, constraints uh, that are slightly shifted to sigma not closer to zero compared to, to what we're showing here. Uh, but DSR3 really helps, uh, you know, moving this towards a sigma naught equals zero. You see, I mean, the shift between the green and, and the purple contour. Okay, so in conclusion, when we had full shape information to BAO, uh, we basically had sensitive to, uh, sensitivity to structure growth. And what we see with DAISY um, is that DAISY full shape favors sigma, uh, sigma 8 and S8 which are totally consistent with Planck and uh, other surveys, uh, reproducing surveys as well. In terms of the expansion history, we've seen that um, our constraints, including full shape, are in, in agreement with, uh, with, the, with the constraints obtained with DESI BAO and, uh, and CMB. Uh, we still see some tantalizing hints for dynamical dark energy. See const the constraints on W and RWA are, are shrinked a little bit. Uh, we still have a preference for a low uh, sum of new masses. Uh, the, the constraints are improved by 15%. And, uh, and we also see that we see no deviations to general relativity when we use uh, the Z full shape data, especially on this uh, mu zero parameter. So yes, that's great. Um, and uh, we already have DR2 data on disk. So we are actually working on the BO analysis using um, uh, since the R2 data, it is ongoing and we expect to have cosmological results soon. So stay tuned. And uh, there are many papers uh, that are planned also using still using this DR1 uh, data. They will appear uh, on this link. With the effective field theory parameters, these nuisance parameters that are a real nuisance, not, not just in the technical definition of nuisance, but in the uh, like colloquial definition. Are there other ways to measure them? I know that there, that you can, in principle, run simulations and have halo models and then measure them that way. But 
are there other ways by other telescopes and things like that that one could could measure things so i know with with for example the weak lensing situation that as i think pauline you were saying they're very sensitive to baryonic physics and i know that x-ray telescopes for example can kind of measure their new parameters such that when you then combine the X-ray telescope, you get better constraints. Are your nuisance parameters measurable by anything, or is that a lost cause? I'm 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 not sure we can really measure like put uh, constraints from other data sets on our measurements uh, on 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 these uh, EFT uh, parameters. Uh, for sure, uh, by having a unified uh, a theoretical model and and pipeline, and this is also what we aim at with uh, these uh, new uh, DESI uh, measurements. We can uh, cross check with different uh, statistics and with different experiments uh, uh, with the the impact of the choice of priors on our cosmological measurements coming from different. Uh, observables and this is also the reason why as Hector said uh, not only we uh, are releasing today uh, the papers and the results but we are going to uh, release uh, the data and the pipeline to, to reproduce uh, our results but I think we have some um, ideas uh, to uh, for instance uh, we uh, there was a paper that uh, suggested to um, um, to uh, use uh, the the fact that is, uh, we have a devolution uh, as a function of redshift of uh, our uh, parameters of the galaxy bias parameters, for instance, and we could uh, imply again some uh, uh, physically motivated priors that account for the redshift evolution across uh, our different uh, samples. So instead of having uh, free galaxy bias parameters per tracer per redshift bin, we could impose uh, some function as a function of redshift, and then it would limit uh, the number, of the total number of uh, nuisance parameters when we analyze together all our redshift bins. There are also uh, work trying to, as you said, use uh, simulations uh, to uh, have what we call HUD informed priors. So in priors that account for uh, uh, this uh, uncertainty about the small scale physics uh, using uh, simulations. And this is maybe also the, from a personal point of view, I would say the, the part where there is a lot of work to be done. So maybe other types of analysis with the same data set could inform us, could inform uh, better the choice of priors we should apply. And uh, but this is just the beginning, and we are also very happy to again to not only share our results but also share a new methodology, uh, a new standard, I would say, to to analyze uh, galaxy clustering data that we hope is going to be useful for uh, for other uh, experiments and for the world community, so that we can tackle these challenges also together uh, with, with different measurements. Another question I had related to the gray band on this plot. Uh, I was kind of surprised that this is the largest scales you get to, but then I think, I think I worked out the answer is that of course, you, you might be observing all the way from redshift zero to redshift two point, whatever, but because you're looking at individual traces and individual bins, you're not able to correlate all the way from redshift zero to redshift 2.8. But is there some scope for like, looking at the like, power spectrum between the bright galaxies and the quasars or, or anything like that? Is that just a ridiculous suggestion or is there some way that that's possible or? Yeah, so these scale cuts are actually not limited by, not so much limited by the volume that we probe within re each redshift bean. Um, it's more a scale cut that is uh, quite conservative because uh, we expect that residual, I mean, potential residual imaging systematics that will typically uh, impact more the larger scales. Um, so the idea of these scale cuts is try to mitigate this a bit and, and be less sensitive to potential residual imaging systematics. And also on large scales, we've got effects like uh, we've got, I mean, this is a bit <clears throat> technical to incorporate the, uh, the effect of survey geometry on the power spectrum and um, 
and different effects that we have when we estimate the power spectrum in large scales, like weight or logger effects, internal constraints. These are very technical things. Um, and, um, and, and so by choosing this scale cut, we're basically uh, erasing any impact from, from, from these uh, potential issues. Um, there are analyses already within DAISY which are looking at larger scales, but and, and they're doing this to, to measure uh, the signature of primarily on non-Gaussianity through so these um, um, FNL local. So they are looking at local uh, primarily on non-Gaussianity which produce a scale dependent bias signature in the power spectrum on large scales, um, in the galaxy power spectrum on large scales. Um, so these, these are potential uh, non-Gaussianity which could be generated by inflation. Um, so these are really uh, interesting measurement, but technical measurements, because um, it's much more involving in terms of uh, of mastering uh, systematics on these large scales. Also, this is the first results of uh, of, of Daisy with the two types of analysis we think are the most uh, robust: BAO and and Galaxy Full Shape. Although we've seen that uh, even just between BAO and Galaxy Full Shape, this is not the same. Uh, uh, complexity in in data analysis, and uh, and it's going to be even more the case as we go to as we consider higher the statistics like uh, the bias spectrum and uh, constra constraints on the primordial non Gaussianity from the bias spectrum are going to be even more uh, uh, promising, but at the cost of course of um, mastering uh, the um, the uh, systematic effects and uh, and. Uh, ensuring that this analysis is as robust as uh, what we can do with uh, two-point statistics, but this is for sure a goal we, we want to achieve and I'm sure we will achieve, yeah. Wow, thanks. That's um, quite a tour de force of the uh, current state of, of DESI, but where are we getting to, to next? I guess you've already mentioned there's three years is coming, but what other improvements to the pipeline or anything else would you like to comment on? So I think, as, as you were said, then there is this upcoming measurement on the FNL uh, signal with the one data. Then next year, we're going to release the BEO three, uh, on the three-year data, so the DR2. Then that will follow for a full shape analysis um, on year three. Uh, at the end of next year, or maybe uh, in two years' time, and then eventually, we're also going to incorporate the bias spectrum on the key uh, paper analysis. So it might be some bias spectrum analysis on year one, but these are not going to be official. So they are not going to represent the official voice of DESI. They're going to be groups within DESI releasing three-point analysis, which is fine, but um, won't be part of official DESI. We plan to have this bias spectrum part of official DESI as a final analysis on year, on year three data. But um, I think there's still a couple of years between this, this will appear. So I think that won't be 2025. But for, for sure, for the BEO, and maybe full shape on 2.2025 2020, would be the year. So I would say stay tuned because with three years of data, our error bars are going to improve significantly. Yeah, I think you said earlier in the interview, like a factor of two, which on that W, not WA, will be. Well, roughly speaking, a factor of two in in the measurements. And W, not WA, it's in combination with other data sets. So I'm not sure the error bars on there will improve. But in terms of DESI error bars, that would be, roughly speaking, a factor of two. Cool. Well, we'll, we'll look forward to that in uh, 2025. Other than that, thanks, everyone, for watching. If you like this, please do subscribe and click the bell if you want to be notified of new videos. Click like to help with YouTube algorithms, both for you and the channel, because YouTube will know to recommend more stuff like this to you and share the channel with colleagues and uh, collaborators. If you have any questions or suggestions, leave a comment. Otherwise, check out the previous talk by Desi on their last uh, batch of key papers uh, related to the BAO. And thank you, Arno, Hector, and Pauline for the great talk. Thank you. Thank you.